Hi, this is Mark Birch, and this is a quick revision of the opening of Macbeth Act 2, Scene 3, the Porter scene. This is the only moment of comedy in the play, and this kind of comic interlude follows the murder of Duncan. So you've gone from one of the most disturbing moments in the play to one of the lightest. And this is what I sometimes refer to as the kind of roller coaster of tragedy that Shakespeare is trying to elevate the audience's emotions after having just dashed them. It's almost as if um, an audience can only experience so much horror, can only feel so profoundly. And once they've reached a really dark point, you can't take them much further down unless you lift them up again first. So rather like a roller coaster, we plummet down with the murder of Duncan and then are lifted up through the porter scene so that we can again have our experiences dashed against the horror of the murder of Banquo, etc. The porter states, oh, here's a knocking indeed. And that reference to knocking informs the audience that this scene follows the previous one directly in terms of uh, temporal scales. The knocking that Macbeth wished would wake Duncan at the end of the previous scene is now being addressed by the porter. He's actually getting up and going to answer the door. Um, and Shakespeare uses the semantic field of hell several times during the course of this, providing a kind of ironic link to the actions of Macbeth. The porter might be talking about hell in abstract terms here, but the audience can appreciate how it's absolutely appropriate to think of Dunsinane and Macbeth in hellish terms. Um, the porter talks about being the porter of Hellgate, suggesting that if there was such a porter, they would never be idle because they'd constantly be answering the door, answering the gate, because so many souls need to enter hell. And again, that's entirely appropriate, entirely apt, given Macbeth's actions. Now, most of the rest of the porter's gags center around kind of satirical jokes based around being the porter of Hellgate. He imagines the kind of people that would turn up to hell. And given that they're satirical jokes, they're not necessarily that funny to us today. So there's no need to kind of cling onto your sides to stop them splitting at this point. What is interesting, though, is the way in which they reveal something about the context of uh, Jacobean England. The first person who he imagines turning up is a farmer. He is a farmer that hanged himself on the expectation of plenty. And there was at the time an excess of produce. Um, the harvests had been really good in 1605 to 1606. So what the porter's imagining is a farmer who had been incredibly greedy, who had withheld his crops in the hope that there would be an absence of um, produce and then he would be able to sell it at a very high price. So the audience might appreciate that such a person who is being greedy might then suffer at their own hands in this way. Also, and this is particularly apt in terms of creating another layer of meaning that would be appreciated by some of Shakespeare's audience. The farmer was a pseudonym for one of the conspirators in the gunpowder plot against James I in 1605. So what we also have is an image that would appeal and an idea that would appeal to those who were in the know, those who would appreciate that kind of satirical level of humour, and those that were going on the more basic level of, oh, this is a greedy farmer who's getting his comeuppance. The second person he imagines appearing at Hell's Gate is an equivocator. And this again could be a reference to the gunpowder plot. Uh, we have Henry Garnet, this Jesuit priest who was hung in 1606. The interesting thing about him is that he used equivocation during his trial to try and hide his involvement in that plot. When he did eventually confess, he claimed that his earlier perjury wasn't perjury as he'd lied for God. Now an equivocator is someone who uses ambiguous language to mislead and so clearly Henry Garnet was being an equivocator and also this is something that appears time and time again in the play, uh, most notably with the witches who use language in order to manipulate Macbeth. They tell him truths that uh, lead him to his downfall. The final profession that the porter imagines meeting at Hellgate is a tailor. He says, Faith, here's an English tailor. Come hither for stealing out of a French hose. 
Now, on the surface, that's a joke about a dishonest tailor, um, someone who would be renowned for stealing fabric from their customers, but was found out because of the introduction of a new fashion, the tight-fitting French hose. There wouldn't be much fabric on this kind of um, garment, therefore stealing the fabric from within it would mean that they would be found out, they would be discovered for their theft. However, it could also be another bawdy gag about tailors who were stereotyped as womanizers and those as a result would perhaps contract syphilis which was known as the French disease. So again you've got a joke, a topical joke, a satirical joke that's working on a couple of different levels. And finally the porter steps away from satire to end with just straightforward bawdy comedy to lighten the mood. He discusses the three things that uh, drink provokes, saying nose painting, in other words, getting a red nose from alcohol consumption, sleep, and urine. Then, once he's established that those are the three things that um, can happen when you've drunk too much, he talks about lechery. And what you get is an extended joke about erections, how alcohol can make a man lecherous, but also make him unable to perform sexually. It makes him and it mars him. It takes him off and sets him on. Um, Shakespeare also extends that concept of equivocation here, the one that we saw earlier in terms of those that uh, he's inviting into Hell's Gate, with alcohol now being the equivocator that can mislead a man's lecherous desires. So while, yes, this is just bawdy comedy on one level, and it'll certainly appeal to the audience, it could also bring in that theme again of the equivocator, though that idea of not being able to trust and being misled. Okay, tough.